Hello there, my friend. Take a seat by the fire. Do you recognize this room? With its comfortable couches, velvet armchairs, gentle candlelight. This is the storytelling room. We've come here more than once, as you've been exploring my castle with me. It's safe, and it's comfortable, and every story told here is about someone else. So we can rest for a moment. It won't affect us. Right? We can have just a little distance, and forget about our own adventures in order to hear of someone else's. A different person. Someone other than us. Very safe and very distant. Yes? I had a question from a friendly ghost this week. Perhaps they will repeat the question for you now. What's more scary, seen or unseen monsters? Thank you, dear ghost. Seen or unseen monsters. I have a story about this. Of course I do, we're in the room for stories. Relax, stretch, find a comfortable position, and we will explore someone else's castle for just a little bit. In a way. You'll see. I think. A person, a person very different from you, a fictional person with very fantastical circumstances surrounding them, woke up in the morning. They prepared for work. They left their home. The day had begun. This person, whoever they are, walked down the street. Everywhere, shining vehicles zoomed past in a loud hurry. Tall skyscrapers with illuminated words emblazoned at their tallest heights pierced the clouds. People looked at their watches and frantically, breathlessly made their way to the place they had to be, hopefully on time, or else they might not easily survive the month. Everyone was afraid of something, you see. A monster that was barely visible among the hustle and bustle. Some might choose to ignore it or pretend it didn't exist. Others could be utterly horrified and repulsed by it and curse it with all their strength. Some might even have the incredible ability to renounce it completely. But the monster was there, in plain sight for all to see, looming high above the city, and it demanded toil and labor in exchange for the simple act of living. Everyone had to live with his watchful gaze over them, whether they liked it or not. This person, the person we are following, glanced up and saw this monster and shuddered. It was a frightening thing, after all, with its ever-watchful, wide-eyed, and all-seeing gaze. This person apologized to it quietly and looked away quickly and kept on their way, trying their best to forget that they had seen the wretched thing that held sway over the land. This person went to their place of work, Fortunately, early. The monster would be appeased for today. Upon completing a document, an invoice, it was called, 
detailing how numbers representing time translated into numbers representing earnings. A sacrifice to that monster. The person froze upon overhearing a peer speak of how many numbers represented the worth of their time in their document. Our protagonist learned that their time was worth less than another's. And at that moment, somewhere else, in a castle far, far away, far away from us, don't you fear, but not very far at all from our protagonist, another monster stirred. An invisible monster, invisible at least to the individual whose castle it resided in, but it crept into the chambers of their heart, the place that actually very much liked that peer, and knew she had others to take care of, and circumstances of her own, and a very, very great fear of that tall monster lurking within the city streets, too. It crept into our hero's heart and filled it up with numbers and fear and worry and need. And the monster took that need and plucked and poked and twisted and broke it over and over and over until that need turned to envy. And the monster of greed nurtured that envy in a little glass greenhouse so that it could thrive and grow its invisible vines and tendrils all throughout the person's heart. The day passed in misery as the invisible monster in this person's invisible castle sang its song screamed it in the echoing halls. Finally, it was time to go home. Walking through the streets, back the way they came, our unhappy person wandered, hands in their pockets, and nodded sheepishly at the looming, lurking one who stood proudly among the rain and the snow while everyone else just tried their best to get home to dinner so they might enjoy what little was left of their day. The person we are following walked through the rain and the snow, wrapping their coat around themselves, their old coat they'd had for years and years which served them well, torn and frayed as it was. Their hair was a mess, but in a way the freedom of allowing it to become soaked in the punishing weather was a welcome kind of catharsis, a cooling of that red-hot greed, at least temporarily. Their shoes were soaked through, but that was fine too, for they would dry eventually, and all would be well once our person here found their way home. This moment was theirs, and they did not mind the weather. It was still a gift. Two other folks, carrying an umbrella, stepping out of a beautiful car, wearing the most splendid, sparkling, clean and dry clothes, laid eyes on our protagonist. They must have been going somewhere very important, very delightful, for the two others' hair looked so neatly done so perfect. And all this, this was fine. As I said, our hero found themselves surprisingly happy, despite everything, and they even allowed themselves delight in admiring the people who were going somewhere special, going to have a lovely night. Until they laughed. At this moment, The very visible monster of vanity watched from above, in the guise of an advertisement for skin cream. 
She watched with very alert eyes, glowing eyes, free from any wrinkles. She smiled with very red and plump lips. Her skin was so smooth, her hair so shiny. But even in disguise as this image of a model that was taken and transformed by a computer, this monster was clearly visible. Everyone saw her, many, many times a day, in fact. Whether one acknowledged her or not, she was always there, and she demanded insecurity and self-consciousness and... Well, I guess needless to say she was in league with the other monster as for what else she demanded. The couple laughed even still as our protagonist went on their walk home, seething. Was it the old, disheveled coat? Was it the soggy shoes? Was it the soaked hair and fogged glasses? Were they even laughing at them in the first place? It didn't matter because the thought had wormed its way into the person's mind. And at that moment, back at that dark and faraway castle within our protagonist, another monster stirred. Another invisible monster crept in, and though one could not see her, she was loud, horribly loud, in her awful wailing. She lamented, she lamented everything, the sounds of her fingernails tearing at her hair and burning it with irons the sounds of paper ripping and the stretching of tape and skin alike echoed throughout our hero's heart, their castle, still covered in vines from the monster of greed, and now being covered with paint and wallpaper over and over and over, being redone and done over and made over again and again and again, so much so that the castle could barely breathe for the smell and the smothering of it all. The person's feet moved a little slower in those wet shoes now, as they felt the weight of the monster of self-loathing within them, screaming and weeping even still. But the person was almost home, and they felt light and lightness alike coming closer and closer, ever closer, despite it all. They walked through a little park, a short detour, but one that they felt they might enjoy taking tonight, despite the cold. The rain had stopped, and now only snow gently fell, covering the trees and making the ground appear as a white lake, still and calm and silent. The person couldn't help but smile. This moment was theirs, and they could have it all to themselves to enjoy, and it was still a gift. They looked up, delighting in the feeling of snowflakes falling on their skin. But then, they saw something. Another monster, most visible of all of them, and perhaps the largest. Maybe the most unabashed of the seen monsters in this place. A monster of black and gray smoke. A laughing face in the smog, pervasive and insidious in its ability to be everywhere at once. It was in the air, it was in the vehicles, it was in the homes, it was on the ground, it was in the soil, it was in the oceans. Everywhere, unchallenged, visible, 
and, like the others, whether it was challenged, acknowledged, or ignored, it was still there, seeable, always. And our hero felt a third invisible monster stir within their castle. A monster that moved as though it were incredibly heavy. The sound of stone being dragged across marble echoing in the shadows. Screeching, scratching. It sighed and heaved labored breaths as it moved through the castle within our hero's heart. Every breath it exhaled was like a thick fog, and it filled the castle with despair and, what's worse perhaps, apathy. It scratched the shining floors. It clouded the clear air and it even made the other monsters of greed and self-loathing all the more miserable themselves. They all moaned a symphony of dread, so loud that our hero's ears throbbed and ached. Finally, they reached home. In the front door, Heavy footsteps going up flight after flight of stairs, down a long hall, key in the lock. They were inside. Invisible monsters still screaming within their castle, perhaps even a little louder now that our hero was safe and alone. They took their wet shoes off and placed them by the welcome mat to dry. They hung up their old, worn coat that had brought them so much comfort. They toweled off their hair, now frozen in some places. They put on warm, clean clothes. And they sat down, facing the window, so they could still watch the snow falling for a few minutes. Softly tumbling, whether invisible or visible monsters were there or not, it still floated down from the air with such grace as to take your breath away. They closed their eyes and decided to summon one final monster. In the halls of our protagonist's castle, a fearsome beast roamed. Tall and strong, it moved slowly and took deep, deliberate breaths. In and out. In and out. Each breath reverberating in the castle walls. It entered the chamber three monsters had set up camp in one allowing vines of envy to grow up and down the walls, gleefully laughing as it did so, another painting the marble floor with a desperate speed, sniffling and sobbing the whole time, and the third mindlessly banging its huge stone head against the wall, sighing, cracking the foundations of the castle. The monster who moved slowly and consciously 
and breathed deeply, watched the three in their chaos. It did not react. It did not grow angry or upset or ecstatic or any of that. It did not react. It just watched and breathed. It breathed a purifying kind of awareness that drew the smoke and the smell of paint out. The vibrations of its voice, steady and deep and gentle, caused the vines to creep back to where they came from and the wallpaper to flake away from the walls. And the gentle smile on its lips caused the three invisible monsters to look back in silence. And they withdrew into the shadows once more. The monster continued to breathe, even when they were gone and the castle's interior walls returned to their normal strength, expanding and contracting, allowing themselves to breathe too, in and out, and in and out, with the monster, invisible as it was, yet the most present and powerful of all of them. Even the seen ones in the city feared this one. And the person in their little home smiled. They felt it within their castle. They felt it within their home. They felt its arms wrap around them, hold them tight, and breathe with them in and out. And our person, our person we've been following, whether completely different from us or exactly the same, smiled. and felt it wasn't really such a bad day after all. There are monsters seen and monsters unseen, outside of us and within us, rampant, all around, ever-present. To answer your question, dear ghost, I feel as though the unseen ones are more frightening because of the power we allow them to have over us. But perhaps the key is to imagine them so clearly that you can see them, just as clearly as you see the monsters outside of yourself. And more than see them, you could perhaps watch them from a distance. Though they are frightening, they don't have to be evil. More often, they're just afraid, or angry, or sad. And that's easily fixed. Because, as the story told, there are much more powerful monsters within you. And those ones can work absolute wonders. And perhaps one of them will be with you tonight, keeping watch, caring for you as you drift off to sleep. Good night, my friends.
Hi everyone, thank you so much for listening to episode 220 of On a Dark Cold Night. This is your host, writer, narrator, podcaster, composer, Kristen Zaza. I hope you're staying well, staying warm, staying rested. First, let's give a big thank you to listener Sean Monroe, who submitted a question this week on YouTube to me. The question of which is more scary, unseen or seen monsters? Thank you so much for this question and for listening, Sean. And I hope this episode found you well, my friend. I would also like to thank a listener who became a patron of the show through Patreon.com this week. Lots of gratitude to Rachel Sladen. Thank you so much for wanting to support what I do, Rachel. If you want to become a supporter in this way, I'll tell you about a few perks you can receive. Patreon supporters of $1 or more a month, US, get complete access to the soundtrack of the show, which has over 200 tracks now. And supporters of $5 US or more receive that, and access to weekly meditations I release every Thursday called Quick Moments, as a bonus. They also get access to a monthly tarot reading video I upload every full moon. To learn more, visit patreon.com slash darkcoldnight. If you'd prefer to donate one time only with no perks, you can do so at ko-fi.com slash darkcoldnight. You can also buy a t-shirt or hoodie at bonfire.com slash on-a-dark-cold-night. If you enjoy what I do, I'd love it if you left a rating and a review for On a Dark Cold Night on iTunes, Spotify, Facebook, or wherever else you like. You can follow me on social media. I'm on Twitter at A Dark Cold Night, Instagram at Dark Cold Night Podcast, on Facebook and YouTube under the page names On a Dark Cold Night, or on TikTok at Kristen Zaza. All those are great ways to reach out if you have a question you'd like to hear me answer in an upcoming episode. Just give me a follow, send me a shout, and I'd love to hear from you. Thanks so much for listening. I hope your most powerful, most caring monsters are with you and your heart this week. Until next time, rest well, friends. Good night. This podcast has been brought to you by the Sonar Network. Sonar.